The Old Testament lesson, appointed for this last Sunday in the church year, is recorded in the last book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Malachi. It's the third chapter we pick up at the 13th verse. And uh, do recall, this is written about 400 years before the birth of Christ. Now, this is important. This is God speaking to Israel. They have been out of Babylonian captivity now a little over 100 years. And in just that short amount of time, just a couple generations of time, they've gone right back to their rebellious, sinful ways. The very things that got them sent into captivity, you know, the pigs returned to its slop, the dogs returned to its vomit. They are rebellious and hard-headed and hard-hearted and unrepentant. So this is God speaking to them. And do pay attention, God calls it like it is. They may, I don't know of any quote-unquote faithful person has ever said, it is vain to serve God. But you got to remember, this is from God's perspective. God cuts through all the garbage and calls it exactly like it is. So, hear these words of Israel, or for Israel, and hear these words for us today. This is God himself. He says, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, well, how have we spoken against you, God? And here's where God calls it out. He says, you have said that it's vain to serve God. What's the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? You know, and now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Well, then those who feared the Lord, they spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention and he heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of all those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them, just as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is recorded in Paul's letter, to the persecuted Christians living in Colossae. Right? It's Colossians, the first chapter we pick up at the 13th verse. And Paul writes, he says, God the Father has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, the Son, he is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, the 23rd chapter we pick up at the 27th verse. And there followed Jesus a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him, but turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? Now two others who were criminals, they were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. 
There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Now, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We, indeed, justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What if you only knew half of the story? Whatever the story may be. What if you only knew half of the story? You know, for instance, uh, the unsinkable HMS Titanic set sail from Southampton, England on April 10th, 1912. That's it. The end. Yeah, there's a bit more to that story, isn't there? Here's another one. The clock struck midnight. Cinderella fled the ball, losing a glass slipper in the process. The end. Well, let's look at, you know, the Bible. Little David, with his little slingshot and a couple of little stones, faced off against the mighty, battle-hardened war hero Goliath. The end. You know, even the little kids hear that, and they say, uh, and? <laughs> There's more to it here, Pastor. There is, right? You can't just tell half the story. These solitary statements, you know, taken out of context, they, they seem very unnatural, don't they? they? They even seem wrong to our ears when you know that the whole story is not being told. Well, as we turn our attention to the gospel lesson appointed for this last Sunday in the church year, we hear all about Good Friday and the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, aside from the simple fact that this reading seems a bit out of place, right, out of season, especially given the fact that we've, well, we've already been bombarded with Christmas cheer since before Halloween time, aside from that, there's the greater reality that we know this is only half the story. You know, there's more to this than simply Jesus was crucified and died, the end. You know, even saying it like that, it reminds me of Thomas Jefferson's Bible. And yeah, that Thomas Jefferson, right, the, the, one of the founding fathers of this quote-unquote Christian nation. He wrote his own Bible. By his own admission, Thomas Jefferson, he, he liked the morality and the good works that were set forth in the Christian Bible. He just didn't like all the, the, the fairy tale stuff associated with Christianity. You know, the miracles which is why he took it upon himself to rewrite the Bible. He, he cut out anything that had to do with the miraculous because, well, you know, that just goes against good sound reason in science, right? You've got to follow the science. In Jefferson's mind, only fools and children believe in miracles. There are no such things as miracles in Jefferson's brand of Christianity. If science can't explain it, if it can't be duplicated in the lab using the scientific process, well, then it's obviously a fairy tale. And this includes the resurrection of Jesus. Because, well, let's face it, people don't just rise from the dead. Jefferson's Bible, and you can still find a copy of it online for sure, Jefferson's Bible omits the resurrection. It simply ends with the dead Jesus being laid in the tomb and a stone being rolled in front of it, the end. <laughs> I hear that and it's like, wow, that's the message, huh? Jesus died and someday you'll die too, the end. Now depart in peace. Man, not only are we missing the rest of the story, but we're missing the best part of the story, both Jesus' story as well as our story. So, okay, uh, well, why then? Why did our church forefathers appoint only half the story for this gospel reading, you know, the last Sunday of the church here? Well, let's come at it like this. Is life for the faithful Christian here on earth, is it easy? Is it any easier for the faithful Christian than it is for the average schmuck on the street? Of course, you know the answer, right? No. Faithful Christians' checkbooks, they still get low. 
Faithful Christians still get sick. Faithful Christians aren't somehow immune to suffering or hardship. You know as well as I do that being a faithful Christian, a practicing Christian in this fallen and sinful world, it's, it's tough. It's getting tougher, too. So tough, in fact, that there are times that we might begin to doubt our Lord's promises, right? There are those tough times in life when, when we can begin to lose trust. I mean, it's not always so easy to believe that God is always working all things for the good of those who love him, is it? It happens. It happens to all of us. And I know some of you, you may not like to admit that, but it's true. There are times in this life when, when we do take our focus off of the whole story that is our reality in Christ because, well, we don't look beyond this half of the story. You know, we don't look beyond right now. What have you done for me lately, God? Well, this is what Malachi was getting at in today's Old Testament lesson. Now, have any of you ever said, it is vain to serve God? Now, I highly doubt it. What God-fearing Christian would ever be so dumb, right? However, have you ever thought to yourself from the midst of your suffering that, well, you know, God, it's not fair. I know I'm not the only one to ever think that. When things get tough in life, on account of your faithfulness to God, on account of your faithfulness to his word, when things get tough, it can be very tempting to look at how good the non-church-going folk have it. It's very easy to, to, look, to long for and even covet the easier life of those people who aren't hindered by a proper fear of God. They're not hindered with trying to keep God's word or, or trying to walk in his way. They're not worried about having to answer to God. They do what they want, right? And they're not saddled with all that guilt that tends to keep good Christians back or good Christians down. You know, you look at that, man, it's not fair. In fact, it's very easy to even begin to call those evildoers blessed because, well, not only do they continue to experience the fun and the ease and the happiness and the prosperity that you don't, but they do it all the while they're, they're openly defying God. And they don't even so much as get a divine slap on the wrist. So yeah, I mean, it's not fair. And so again, no, I know no one would ever say it's vain to serve God. We would never say that. But in our hearts... If we're bold to confess, in our hearts, we've all entertained the notion of, you know, is, is all this hardship that I'm going through, is it worth it? Am I wasting my time? You know, why can't I just do what everyone else is doing? Why can't I do what I want and I'll just repent later? I mean, it obviously worked okay for the thief on the cross, right? You know, here's another question that... Uh, that reveals our tendency to focus only on this half of our story. Something bad happens to you, whatever that may be. Something bad happens to you in life, and some, something doesn't go the way you think it should. Have you ever looked to heaven in that time in, in frustration and exasperation, and you asked, you know, why me, God? And you've asked that question with the genuine feeling that, you know, you deserve better. Why God? Why me? Why this? Why now? You know, why is this not happening to that jerk over there? Uh, doesn't he deserve it more than I do? God, this doesn't make sense. To which I have to say, you're right. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. But you know what else doesn't make sense? You know what's truly not fair? Look at that cross. Right? Look at the cross of Jesus. The perfect and sinless Almighty God himself, he had to die so that the sins of the world could be washed away in his holy, innocent blood. Almighty God himself died for lowly, undeserving sinners. Almighty God himself had to die for us lowly, undeserving sinners because there was no other way. You know, without this, the crucifix, without Christ on the cross, we would have zero hope for redemption. 
I mean, look at this cross, guys. If anyone deserved better, if anyone deserved to ask why, it was Jesus Christ. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If anyone deserved better, it was him who came down from heaven into this fallen sinful world. He gave up heaven for this. He lived the absolutely perfect life in God's eyes by keeping God's laws perfectly. Yet no one else ever descended from Adam has ever been able to pull that off. Not even close, right? And, and good intentions count for nothing. You know, as the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Jesus kept God's law perfectly. He lived the truly perfect, godly, God-pleasing life that none of us do. And what did he get in return? A common, common criminal's execution. And worse than that, Jesus actually suffered the fate that no person has ever had to suffer while they walk this earth and still have air in their lungs. Jesus was truly forsaken and forgotten by God. Not because of anything he'd done to deserve it, but solely because this is the only way we could be reconciled and restored to our Heavenly Father. Guys, this is precisely why on this last Sunday of the church here that we focus on and even celebrate the events of Good Friday. We do it because we know the rest of the story. This gospel lesson helps us, or it maybe even forces us, to focus on and hold fast to the rest of the story, to, to our baptismal resurrection story in Christ. It, despite what may be happening now in our lives, no matter how dark and desperate and scary things may seem right now, we remember, right? We know, we hold fast to the, bapti the baptismal promise that baptized into his death and resurrection, we are, present tense, we are victors in Christ, in Christ and because of Christ. And the best is still yet to come, isn't it? You know, even in something as sorrowful as death, we Christians have right now, we have what no one else has. We have a joyous hope and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Yeah, we still grieve, all right? That's normal. That's natural. It's okay to cry. You don't have to be strong for the kids or anything like that. It's okay to grieve death. But like St. Paul says, we don't grieve like those who have no hope in the resurrection to come. Knowing the rest of the story, knowing the whole story, it just changes things. Folks, this is why our church forefathers appointed this gospel lesson for the last Sunday in the church year. You know, just as the church year comes to an end, well, so also then are we able to recognize our own earthly lives, ever drawing closer to their end, drawing closer every day, every second, to that blessed day when our Heavenly Father will summon us home to paradise to be with him. And for the Christian, death is no longer something to be feared. It's simply a stepping stone, right? Jesus refers to it as falling asleep. We don't die, we fall asleep in Christ. Death isn't something to be feared. It's simply a doorway that we pass through as we enter into the blessed eternal life that's already been won for us on the victorious cross of Christ. The victory that is ours this very day as he comes to us and feeds us with this life-giving word and body and blood. The victory that is ours as he comes to us and nourishes us now, even the here and now, until that wonderful blessed day when he does call us home. Right? Amen, amen. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Clearly knowing and trusting in, in the rest of the story, you know, the whole story, the entire gospel promise of Christ crucified and risen for the sins of the entire world, clearly knowing and trusting in the whole story, boy, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? That's why it's called a peace that surpasses all understanding. So may this Christ-centered difference, this peace of Christ, may it be witnessed in all that you say and do, now and into all eternity. Amen.